Welcome back to The Debrief, the competitive climbing podcast. And uh, we're going to get right into it this week because there is a lot to talk about. As always, I'm Tyler Norton from Plastic Weekly. Joining me, as always, is uh, John Bergman, who reports on competitive climbing for climbing.com. And our special guest this week, none other than Charlie Bosco, one of the lead commentators uh, for the IFSC in recent years and somebody that happened to come up at the same time as Yanya Garnbrett. And so he has a special connection with her as a climber. Uh, he's also uh, dabbled in other uh, other media ventures, talking a lot about athletics and the athletic mindset and and athletic greatness in general. And so I thought he would be the perfect person to talk to on such a momentous uh, a momentous occasion. Is such a cliche, but I'll, I'll just to to lead into it. I'll be frank. This was the most emotional I felt watching a competition on the internet since the Olympics and and maybe uh, Yanya completing the streak in 2019. So let's get into it. The headline, as always, we give it to the guest. So Charlie, what is the headline from Coper 2022? The headline from Coper 2022, which may be pronounced copper, no one's quite sure, is um, that Yanya didn't win. And I was thinking about this before I came on the podcast, and I think that Certainly by the end of her career, you could make a very strong case for Yanya being the most dominant athlete in the history of sport, come not this sport. And we're now at the stage where when Yanya doesn't win, we it's a momentous occasion which requires a podcast. And <laughs> it's just something that we've never really seen before in climbing. We've had people have good seasons. I think Jakob Schubert might have won six out of seven in one of the lead years. But to have someone who wins eight World Cups in a row and then um, doesn't win the ninth in a row and it's a big deal it is unprecedented. And uh, I think she's probably, I, I'm biased, but I think she could already be the most dominant athlete in an individual sport ever. And by the time she retires, I'm sure she will be. So. Well, I was just going to say, it doesn't have to be a momentous occasion for there to be a podcast about it, especially when it's a bunch of white guys on the internet. That is the meme, right, about podcasts. <laughs> Nothing has to go on for, for a bunch of white guys to get on cameras and do a, do a podcast. But yeah, uh, talking about the fact that this was something we were all uh, 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 concerned isn't the right word, but it was the storyline for the season, let alone that she had won a couple lead World Cups uh, before the season. So the streak by itself was being continued and ended this week weekend but of course the chat from right from the beginning of the boulder season was that there might be an attempt to sweep the lead season which hasn't really been done um you can make a case that robin Erbisfeld swept a four event season back in i think like 94 it was or something like that kind of hard to compare a four event season to a seven event season to like a you mentioned jakob schubert's attempted sweep which i think was like a, a nine or or trying to remember how many stops that was. I think he won seven in a row and then Romain de Grange and I think it was, or not Romain, uh, sorry, uh, Ramon got him off guard uh, and uh, I can't remember where the event was. But yeah, it was a long season, right? It's kind of hard to compare four events to seven events to to 10 events, depending on the uh, on the year. John, um, what, what was your takeaway from, from this event? How did it leave you feeling? Yeah, th that was my headline as well. I, I know that Normally on this show, what we do is we kind of each choose a separate headline, but I think that has to be the headline period I, for all three of us. How can you not come away from this event with Yanya losing or Yanya getting silver medal or Yanya not getting gold medal? However you want to frame it, the resonance is all about Yanya's result as opposed to, say, Imori's result, winning the gold medal. And that's probably not completely fair in the sense that life is not fair, right? Like you, you can't help but feel for Yanya a little bit. She, in, she uh, indicated on Instagram that she took this loss really hard. She felt like she had let people down. She, she cr admitted to crying and stuff. So your, your heart really goes out to her, but looking at it objectively, that is the big takeaway is that Yanya did not, did not win the gold medal here. And, I think it's interesting because I, I think you could kind of look at this competition if you want to editorialize a little bit. I, I think you could make a strong case for this competition being somewhat of a bust, or you could make a strong case for this competition being really great. And I think 
it kind of depends a little bit on your fandom, I suppose, which one you want to lean towards. I Let's break them down a little bit real quickly. I think you could make a case for it being a bust in the sense that all of the puzzle pieces were falling into place for this to be a really, truly iconic, memorable event. I mean, obviously it was memorable for different reasons, but memorable in the sense of you could have had double gold by Slovenian athletes in the host country, in a Slovenian city. And that is such a rare thing to have both the man and the woman winning from the host country. I could think of like Kitzbühel in 2013, Anna Stor and Jakob Schubert won, I believe, in, on the bouldering circuit. But it doesn't, it doesn't happen very often. And so I think especially when Luka Podichar won in the men's division, you kind of started to get a little hyped for it. There was kind of like this, oh, maybe, maybe, maybe this buzz for that. Can I, can I be honest? That made it feel like, oh, there's, this cannot be good. Like it was just, it, the buildup was too much and it almost felt like it would be too good to be true. Uh, that was, that was my first sign that something was wrong was when a Slovenian man won, won the gold medal. Well, maybe. And I mean, the result was when Yanya didn't win the gold, I, I think everybody just was a little deflated, even if they were kind of thinking it was too good to be true. Uh, you could the crowd literally the crowd stood there in a stunned silence i think everybody was just kind of like what just happened and on top of that it dashed any chance of yanya sweeping the lead season which is always exciting and especially for us in media that's a fun thing to cover it's a rare thing to sweep a season as you mentioned tyler so all of that made it kind of a bust on the other hand it was a great comp in the sense of a huge upset and arguably maybe the biggest upset in modern comp climbing history. On top of that, I Maury's climbing style is really fun to watch. She's got this kind of jumpy precision kind of dynamic style, but also a lot of contortion. It's just very unique. It's, it's, it's good stuff to, to soak in. And if I Maury continues on the world cup circuit, this set up a lot of intrigue, for that and certainly set up a lot of intrigue for the the upcoming Olympic qualification pathway. So all of that made this competition great. So like I said, it was either a great competition or a bust, depending on how you look at it. I'll close with this, and then I want to get your your thoughts on this, Tyler, and 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 Charlie as well. I think this competition kind of reminded us of where we were or where we thought we would be back in 2019 and i know i feel like i always reference that season but that's because that was like the last normal season right if we remember back cheon so beat yanya a number of times so by the end of that season we didn't have this sense that yanya was invincible or unstoppable on the lead circuit she, she, we had the sense she looked very vulnerable and very uh kind of on par with a number of other women laura regora Cheon So, obviously. Then 2020, that season's a wash because the pandemic. 2021, that season's weird because Olympic, the qualification pathway and people stopping the circuit short to do the Olympics and whatnot. And then this season, the lead season starts out. And I think because Yanya did so great up until this event, I mean, she still did great, but great meaning gold up until this event, I think it was easy for us to revert back back to this thinking of, oh, yeah, Yanya is head and shoulders above everybody else. And this competition was just kind of a reminder that that's not the case. The, the gap between Yanya and these other women is is really close. Maybe in 2019, it was Cheon So and Laura Regora. Now it seems to be maybe I Mori, obviously, and maybe like Brooke Rabatou and stuff. Those are the ones that are kind of pushing closer and closer to Yanya. Um, but yeah, this competition kind of reminded us of where we were when 2019 ended. I think. Let's uh, let's let's talk about the ingredients for all of this. And the first one I want to address is the wall and the root setting. Um, I, I don't know, Charlie, if you had any particular thoughts. The first thing I saw when I when I saw images of this new wall was it reminded me of like basically the Impst World Cup wall flipped horizontally, reduced by 80%, and then they kind of like unsteepened the roof a bit. Uh, it's a good looking wall. Did you enjoy how it how it looked and how it seemed to climb? And then also just your thoughts on the on the root setting from the event. Yeah, I didn't 
didn't have any massively strong opinions on the wall. It looked okay. I mean, um, it, it, I mean, ultimately, it always comes down to the setting, right? So, I've never been, I've never seen a good World Cup with bad setting, and I've never seen a bad World Cup with good setting. So, um, I think the wall, the wall, yeah, the wall. It was kind of an unusual looking wall, but it, it, it's always about the setting, and every World Cup ever has been about the setting, and it always will be. And I thought the set has got it really good. Mm-hmm. I have no problem. With a, I, I can't swear. I have no problem with. Oh, no, you can uh, if you want. <laughs> it's okay. I have no problem with a, a super hard route. Um, maybe it was a little bit too hard, but um, I've watched a lot of lead finals where, and when you're the person whose job it is to talk about it, you really feel this. Um, where nothing happens for the first three minutes of every attempt, and you know nothing's going to happen for three minutes. Whereas on this one. There was obviously like a slightly easy section at the bottom, easier, but it, they both, both the men's and women's routes p- kicked in pretty quickly. And I actually quite like that. Um, but uh, for some people, it might have been a bit too hard, but I, I really liked it. I thought the setting was great. And I think they should always, if you're going to aim to be too hard or too easy, they should aim to make it too hard. I think that's been the, the theme of discussion this year has been when the setting was hard, it made for excellent competition. And when the setting was too easy, it made it feel really empty, um, which obviously everybody in hindsight looks back to. And of course, you had to deal with uh, what was that Paris 2016? I'm trying to remember the yeah. the Jesse Pills and Yanya Garnbrett going back oh. to time and just that that awful yeah. nightmare of a decider, right? A scenario we never want to be in anymore. Yeah, that was yeah Innsbruck. 2018 yeah i remember that but also oh, right, i remember um that first season i did at the ifsc was 2016 and and in the lead they basically couldn't believe how good the best women were and they used to set easy routes and literally like week in week out jane kim anna verhoven and yanya would top the final route and it would be count back to this to the previous round and yanya won and anna was second and jane was third and it was the same every week and it was really tedious so i love seeing and also like it's it's like a waste of yanya and i mori to just see them cruise up some route it's great to see them absolutely at the living end that's what we want to see and if that's 20 moves in or 40 moves in i don't really care like i want to see that fight right at the end of the route so i'm all in for hard routes and 20 moves in yanya looking really stressed that's great it's what i want to see so I thought the setting was great. I got no problem with it. Yeah, you could make it 1% easy. It might have been better, but I, I'll take that setting any day over a route that gets three tops. Mm-hmm. Yeah, John, what about you? Yeah, I'm, I'm in line with Charlie. I, I suppose if I really was nitpicking, I would have preferred to see at least one top in the finals just because, I don't know, there's something, um, uh, I don't know, just something about the the uh, i don't even know what i'm trying to like the narrative of it just like oh, somebody reaching the top conceptually and climbing like that sure. seems like that's that's good to have but on the flip side if the choice is or or if the sweet science is is going to make it so there's either too many tops or no tops i would definitely prefer no tops and and i also agree with charlie i like it when they kick it into high gear really low on the wall let's get into it right away let's not have any gimme sections let's not make this boring until the competitors reach hold number 25 and 26 or whatever like let's get let's get tough right away whether that means starting with a a run and jump or something or whether that means sticking some hard moves up in the teens right there yeah no problem there and and i thought it made for a really uh, compelling story when when yanya was climbing and the fact that she she did look troubled or, or looked like she was exerting some effort pretty much right away on the wall. I think Matt Groom had some great commentary there when he pointed that out. And he said, you know, you can see on her face that she's she's struggling with this. That that added to the intensity. Mm-hmm. And uh, and I liked that. So, I yeah, I thought the setting was thumbs up for me overall. I think my concern about about tops is is getting a top is kind of 
it is the cherry on top, right? And if I think if you're trying to bake a cake and you demand cherries on top, you're going to have to go out. You're going to have to buy an entire can of maraschino cherries. All of a sudden, you have this, you, this, you know, I've got like 90 cherries. How am I going to use them? And you just start dumping cherries all over this cake. And it might be kind of the situation in root setting that if you're aiming for one top, you will often end up with more than one. And so I think it, it can't be something we ask for anymore. It has to be a delightful surprise that you get once or twice a season. And I, I mean, frankly, what are people going to be watching back when they watch this event? They're going to be analyzing the crap out of the moves that I made and that Yanya couldn't and how they how, uh, how they made those moves different from each other. And I think I, without the top, it just forces people to really focus on the individual moves where that stress came up and their styles were different. So I'm, I think I'm done asking for tops at this point. I thought like in, in qualifiers, every single qualifier route got a single top, which is incredible. In semifinals, only the women's route got a top. There was only one of them and it was Yanya. And I think just for the event in general, the route setting pretty much nailed it. It was some of the best of the season. And apart from, you know, one exception, the route setting this season has been exceptional. It's been so refreshing to talk about the route setting being nails hard and bringing the best out of the climbers and, and pushing them all the way to the limit. So yeah, I've got no complaints. And yeah, and having obviously been to a lot of World Cups and, and worked quite closely with the setters, because as a commentator, a lot of my job was like, tell me where they're going to fall off. Why will they fall off? What are the two ways of doing this move? So I interacted a lot with the root setters. Um, and I used to say it all the time in commentary. I said it lots of my, my reports. I used to write about the comms. It's, it's an unbelievably hard job. Imagine if you've got Jakob Schuber, Adam, Alex Megos, Alberto, whoever you want. And you're like, right, you have to create a route that only one of these guys can top. You know, and there's... It's, it's almost, I, would, I don't want to say it's impossible. We have had, like, when Adam won in Paris in 2016, last climber out, only person to top the route. Like, it's amazing. But it, it's to say we only want one top is like saying, well, every NFL game has to be won with the last second touchdown. Mm -hmm. like, well, it's great when it happens, but it's almost impossible to engineer it every time. So um, I think the route setters always aim for that one person tops the route. If it happens to be the last person, all the better. Um, that's obviously the gold standard, but we, we, I think like you said, we can't ask for that every week. That's, it just can't be achieved that every sporting event is won with the ultimate drama in the last second. Mm -hmm. uh, but we got, they get pretty close an amazing amount of the time. Um, and I thought, uh, I, I, I agree with you that this year, the route setting has been really, really good. I want another thing, Charlie, that's added onto that is a, uh, one of the challenges I would imagine of this competition is let's not forget that Imori is far from a regular presence on the circuit right now. And so it's one thing to say, let's set this and let's set it a level where we know it's going to test Yanya or to your references. Like we know that Adam's going to be there, Adam Andre, or we know that Jakob Schubert's going to be there, whatever we can set for them. How do you know what Imori's level is going into this event, right? You have no idea, and, and at least not unless you've kind of been watching closely the the Japanese national circuit. And so that just pr was another big challenge, I would imagine, for these route setters is maybe not even knowing how to how to plan for Imori and her skill set, or maybe not even thinking to do that and getting lucky. But yeah, I can't imagine that they would have singled her out. Like, I mean, at you look at the we've we've kind of waxed poetic about this women's field right now, where you've got this incredible stack of six, seven, eight women that you see consistently in every finals. Why would you expect a climber who hasn't been around for like two years to make any real change to that dominant field, right? Like, what's she going to do that Yanya, Chayun, Natalia, Brooke, Natsuki, uh, Jesse? What 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 can Imori do that the rest of them can't do? I think that would be completely unreasonable to expect to, there to be anything for them. And through the qualifiers and semifinals, I mean, she was clearly talented and, and looked excellent and semifinals just barely coming in second. Um, but yeah, I don't think there's, again, just like kind of trying to force a top. I don't know how much you can specifically do for Imori. We'll see what Edinburgh looks like. You know, it might be, that might be the impetus for the setters to take it up another level uh, when we see, oh shit, there's somebody else who we haven't, you know, we've only seen once. Now let's really test this person now that we see how they move. It, it could be interesting. Yeah, and, and also just quickly coming back to that, like at the start of the season, the root setters have no idea of anyone's level and it's amazing how often they get that right. Mm -hmm. So 
kudos to them. And then just quickly, I mean, I feel like you could have a podcast about how cool root setters are, but if you think about what a like what a root they don't they don't need the ego boost. We please nobody make a nobody make a uh, podcast about that. What's the difference between God and a root setter? <laughs> Pardon me. What's the difference between God and a root setter? Got a root. I, I I don't know, but I like where this is going. God doesn't think he's a root setter. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, but a lot of them are pretty close to the big guy upstairs. No. Oh um, yeah. No, but I was going to say when you're setting, particularly a lead route, but even in the boulder, the root setters obviously cannot climb the route in one go, because if they could, they'd be competing. So although they're immensely strong climbers who can uh, red point amazingly well, they're not doing the route in one go. So they not only have to estimate like how hard is each individual move, but they might do five moves, take a rest, do another five moves. So they then have to think, well, if I hadn't taken a rest and I was a World Cup level climber, how tired would I now be? And how much would that section have tired me out or not tired me out? So they're not even, it's not like they can just jump on the route and try it and go, well, I got to hole 30 and they're a bit stronger than me. So let's, you know, they'll get a top. They, they have to take it like three, four moves at a time and then somehow in their head compute that into how tired the best climbers in the world will be by that stage. So the amount of estimation involved in route setting is mind blowing and to be as close as they are as often as they are just never really ceased to amaze me and, and it also made me pissed off when people would get on their backs online you're like wow you, you should come to a world cup and see what it's like to set a sure. world cup and you you add one jib that turns the crux move into a slightly easier move so suddenly you get three tops and you made that decision after five days working your ass off with no sleep and it transformed the comp and like people going after them and giving them a hard time. I think I think they do an amazing job. And when you yeah, when you really think about how how many unknowns there are in that calculation to be as close as they are is, is amazing. So it's a cliche term, but yeah, the idea of athletic empathy uh, in root setters and and being able to have some internal understanding of how other people will climb something is is an incredible skill. It's one I didn't have, which made root setting super hard for me. I could barely set stuff for myself, frankly. So uh, it's, I, I I can understand how difficult that is. Um, like, I, I want to. I really want to set a, a bit of context. For, okay, go ahead. I was going to say, imagine, imagine you're a six foot, um, hundred and sixty pound male. And you have to imagine what it's like for a five foot, hundred pound female to climb a route who has less power, but more endurance than you. Mm -hmm. That's basically the calculation you're making. It just, yeah, sure. like you said. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. Somebody's got the air brakes on going down a hill. Yes. Yeah, I can hear the 18 wheeler in the background. All right, I want to I want to talk about the context of this and why there's been so much talk of of a possible season sweep uh, before we kind of finish up with this. And and I think it's important um, because you know winning four World Cups in one season. Uh, it seems kind of early almost. You're basically only just crossing the halfway point uh, to to start, you know, being disappointed that somebody didn't sweep a season, which is so exceptionally rare over, you know, 30 something years of lead climbing. Why is it even fair to place that expectation? Uh, and, I, and I just want to break this down for anybody that hasn't been following along. And it has to start in 2019 when Yanya takes a bouldering season seriously for maybe the first time where she has spoken about, you know, I really want to have an impact on bouldering. I want to give it my best shot. She so, shows up in 2019 and happens to sweep the entire bouldering season that year. The first time a bouldering season has ever been swept. It was a huge deal. Somebody and it being done by an athlete, Yanya, who has been considered a lead climber up until then like we she obviously had bouldering chops she had already won world cup golds in bouldering um uh and i think she came second in the season or two before in the overall um uh but that set the standard and going into the lead season that year so the boulder season finishes in Vale, and i think we were about to go to i guess it was probably innsbruck or something as the first lead world cup of 2019 all of a sudden, the discussion was, is it possible that this incredibly talented multifaceted climber could possibly sweep the lead season as well after seeing how dominant and nearly unquestionable her success was in bouldering? Uh, and what changed, and I think in hindsight, what we're kind of realizing is how exhausting it is to do an entire boulder season and then be confronted with 
a lead season after that, how much time that is, how exhausted your body gets and how little time you have to recuperate and actually train uh, when you're doing both seasons uh, in their entirety. And the second piece that really changed things was these new faces, namely Chai and So of Korea, who ended up winning th three, four, five of the lead world cups that season. And she was kind of the breakout star of 2019. So it was this combination of expectation and seeing what Yanya could do already. And the, uh, I don't want to say inevitable, but the, the continuous addition of new names to the scene. And that year it just seemed like there was a crop of young women who were monsters on the lead wall. Uh, and so 2019 is kind of the context for, for this year where we already know that Yanya can sweep a season and there's discussion after she bailed on the rest of the Boulder year where, okay, maybe she wants to focus on the lead. Maybe she wants to match her Boulder sweep with a lead sweep as well. And we all certainly know it's within her capability after, after winning the 2021 season, she won every lead event that she was at. She was only at three of them. She still won the entire season. Um, so, so that's kind of why there was expectation, right? She had given herself time to rest. We knew that she was capable of a sweep or something similar from previous years. She's the Olympic champion and it seemed like she was kind of preparing for it. She set herself up to have an excellent lead season by intentionally taking off the Boulder season. Um, and I, I wanted to have Yanya as my winner for this debrief. I'm not going to, but I wanted to. And it was because with all of this expectation, right, uh, with with all of the the pressure of being at a home competition, which has historically been kind of a, 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 um, a, a bit of an Achilles heel for, for Yanya. She's disproportionately had poorer results when she's competing in Slovenia compared to, to other places. So with all of that pressure, it was a bit of a, you know, it was kind of asking for, for maybe a, a, um, not the results she wanted. This might be the place where she stumbles from all that pressure. Um, and what made it so, so brutal is that she's been consistently winning against the Cheyennes and the Natalias and the Brooks all year long. And it took this athlete who has had multiple years to rest up. She's still been climbing. I has still been training, but she's been preparing for university, which she, which she started this fall. And the ingredients for all of this, all of the expectation on Yanya, all of the preparation, and then combined with this fresh arm, this, you know, this relief pitcher basically coming in and being extraordinary, uh, it, it just, it, it was, it was the perfect storm for something like this. You can certainly imagine a world where if I Mori decides not to compete just yet, uh, or if her form, if she, if she's got some ring rust for not having competed at a world cup for basically three years, uh, you can see another world where, where this would have been a win. And so I, I can't keep going over in my head how many different factors had to kind of add up for this to, to happen. Um, I'm curious if you guys were just like any particular point of context that you found really interesting in this buildup. I, I can, yeah, I think one thing you don't want to underestimate is also the psychological power of Yanya. So, Amori maybe comes in a little bit green, like hasn't even been in the same room as Yanya for three years since mm -hmm. Hachiyoshi 2019. Um, comes in fresh, comes in with absolutely no pressure. Whereas uh, Brooke and Natalia and, and Jesse and all the other people that we see at the business end of, of World Cup have been getting beaten week in, week out by Yanya. And um, I don't know, I, I don't speak to any of them regularly, but like, you know, when, you, when you're lying in bed in the dark looking at the ceiling, do they really deep in the, deep down inside them believe that they can beat Yanya in front of 10,000 people? Well, I'm not, I'm not sure they do. Cause, um, and I wonder if I'm already just kind of strolled in, not a care in the world and, um, and didn't have any, any weight on her shoulders any intimidation from Yanya. And uh, I think that's probably quite a big factor. No pressure can... I mean, look what pressure does to Yanya. Sure. Um, she, she struggles a little bit under, under pressure sometimes. No, that's nonsense. At times, the pressure affects her. Um, and there was no pressure on I this, this last week. So um, I think that's, that's probably quite a big factor. I was thinking about how this all reinforces my my theme of this either being a bust or being a great comp depending on how you look at it you could you can isolate that down to i maury's presence as well because on the one hand it was it kind of 
kind of cool, I guess, that like there's this person who's intermittent, to say the least, on the World Cup circuit, if not just usually absent. Uh, I think her last World Cup was three years ago, 2019, and she's just able to swoop in kind of out of nowhere and like beat the best. That's that's a pretty baller move, right? <laughs> like to do that. And yet, on the other hand, um, I I don't I don't know how Yanya takes it, but I know if I was Yanya and in that situation, it might be kind of frustrating. Like you're kind of like you're kind of like, well, look, like I. I beat these people that have been like consistently near the top on the like, and then all of a sudden this person comes out of nowhere and swoops in like that's, that's a whatever annoying, frustrating, maddening, all of those things. So you could you could kind of see that side of it as well. And again, I don't want to put words into Yanya's mouth. I don't know how she feels about it, but uh, but I think you could you could logically see it both ways. Both it very exciting and interesting that I did that out of nowhere. And also a little bit maybe frustrating in a sense, and even frustrating to us in the sense of we think just as soon as we think we have a handle on this season and the dynamics of this season and who the big names are. I mean, we're like, you know, we're way into this lead season now. We should have an idea of how the narrative is going. And then all of a sudden there's this M. Night Shyamalan swerve of uh, like I'm Ori coming out of nowhere. And it's like, whoa, okay. So now all of a sudden we have another big name on the circuit. So just... Yeah, a lot of different stuff at play there in relation to I's presence at this one. Yeah, All right. Just just quickly, I, Mori is the real deal. This is not like a flash in the pan. Uh, I remember 2019 in Hachioji. I don't remember if it was the lead final or the final of the combined and the lead route, but there was a route uh, where she would have spanked Yanya. She was like so much stronger, but she kind of got lost. Uh, <laughs> You know, like when you're climbing outdoors and you go the wrong way and you have to come mm -hmm. back to the last bolt. And she kind of really went kind of off route, which is very hard to do on a comp route, but she managed to do it. And uh, ke like came back down or s traversed back into the real route and carried on. And she, I remember Mike Langley said she looked flamed and the <laughs> phrase just stuck with me. She just took waste and she just kept going. Mm -hmm. And if she'd read the route correctly, she had much more endurance. And uh, I remember, I can still remember watching her and looking up from the screen just because normally I watch the monitor when I'm commentating. And I remember looking at the screen, I was like, no, she, she really is still on the wall. Like, my eyes do not deceive me. Um, she's the real deal. This is not um, her coming along and having a good day. It's, she didn't have any pressure on her and she's had a bit of a break and she's probably pretty refreshed mentally. But this isn't a flash in the pan. If she competes regularly, she will win regularly. She's, let's talk she's... more. Let's talk more about I in a moment. Um, uh, I want to. I want to finish uh, talking about the, this this event. Um, uh, Charlie, right at the beginning, you uh, mentioned your thoughts that you feel like Yanya may be in the in the pantheon of greatest athletes ever. And I wanted to ask you a little bit about that, particularly uh, how you because uh, for somebody like me, I don't watch that many sports, right? Uh, I'm, I'm not a general sports fan. I know John is, is, uh, 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 much more into some sports. I'm, I'm not sure exactly what John follows. Some are team, some are individual, but something that I find very daunting is trying to compare achievements in one sport to another, particularly when the seasons are different and, and the type of athletic demand is different. So I just wanted to get your thoughts on, on why you think she's somebody that should be considered in that discussion and how you, how you compare her to, to the other great individual athletes in other sports. Well, I mean, you, the first thing to say is you're right. You can't compare them. And, and even within one sport, can you really compare Yanya to Robin Ebbetsfield? Because they were even even that sport it's not the same as it was in the early 90s so it, they can't be done you can't compare tiger woods to michael jordan as it will be done though so we might as well talk about it <laughs> it's fun to do it but what i mean it's not like someone's going to come up with an answer and we all go correct yeah yanya is the sure. sixth greatest athlete of all time like it's it's a fun debate but it, it isn't necessarily a meaningful debate and it's certainly not one which will ever be settled but um i think so i did some research um about Yanya in a, in a bigger, more global context for a project I was working on. And by the age of 22, uh, Yanya was the first woman to win World Cup seasons in two disciplines, the first woman to win world championships in two disciplines, 
the first person to win a world championship in two disciplines at the same world championship. And she won three disciplines because she won the combined as well mm-hmm. uh, in Hachiogi. She was the first person ever to clean sweep a bowler season. She was the first Olympic champion in climbing's history. And she has a superior win rate at Grand Slam World Cup level than Serena Williams, Roger Federer, Michael Schumacher, or Lewis Hamilton, or Tiger Woods. In fact, she has a double, double the win rate of any of those people I've just listed. So that's before the age of 22, when you're still three, four years off your physical peak. Um, so I just think if she can continue winning uh, at anything like the rate she's been doing until, what, LA 2028, she could win, I don't know, could she win 100 World Cups? I like I, it, it, The numbers could just get so insane that I just don't think any other individual athlete in history would be able to live with the volume that she's, she's won and the dominance across multiple disciplines. Um, so for me, she... It would be a fun conversation one day down the line, five, six years from now, when she, she calls it a day, to compare her final statistics with the final statistics of, of some of those other sporting greats. I think she'd be right up there. Hmm. John, what about you? Any any input? Yeah, I think um, aside from comp- just accolades, medals, championships, all that stuff, I think one of the things that can help you compare one athlete and one athlete's greatness in a certain sport to another athlete's greatness in a different sport is the degree to which they changed or evolved that sport. And I think um, something you see with Yanya is also something you see with, like, like Charlie said, whether it's Tiger Woods or Michael Jordan or like like nowadays with the U.S. Open going on and Serena Williams' retirement, you're hearing all this stuff about how Serena changed how the game is played in the sense that she introduced, for example, uh, like a much stronger, much faster in terms of miles per hour serve for the women for the in the women's game and and really kind of elevating that um, several st- several steps or several like speed notches ahead of where it was prior to when Serena was on the circuit. And I think you can certainly do that with Yanya as well. I think maybe it'll be easier to do that when Yanya is retiring, when we can kind of look back and see just how she changed or evolved how comp climbing is done. But I think Yanya has certainly done that. I think if you look at, for example, Yanya's climbing style, um, you can isolate it down to something like a single move, like the Yanya move or the Yanya flick or whatever. But I think that speaks to something larger in this style of climbing in the women's division. That's much more dynamic and much more to the point where you really can't separate the climbing styles between the men's and the women's division anymore. Uh, um, In regards to Yanya, I think Yanya, you can't say she like climbs like a woman or she climbs like a man. She just she just climbs, right? And that's the way it should be. I think that ultimately you don't want any division there. And I think Yanya is kind of leading the way at breaking down those barriers, maybe breaking down that separation a bit. Um, I think she has changed the way that comp climbers move. I think she's ushered in a far more dynamic style, but coupled with incredible flexibility and stuff like that. I mean, I, I think she is just kind of like the quintessential 21st century comp climber, um, more so than anybody else that we've seen in the 21st century. And um, like I said, when she retires, I think we'll be able to look back and say, yeah, she really changed how this comp climbing thing was done. I think that's a really good point. I think another thing that Yanya's really done is she's changed everyone else's views of what can be done and what it means to be good. If you think about most climbers, we can say, oh, such and such, he, he's so good at crimps, or this climber's so good at heel hooks, but she doesn't like toe hooks. There isn't really, I mean, walking out on a World Cup map before a final, I never really looked at a boulder and thought, no, oh, Yanya's not going to like that, or uh, that move's going to prove tricky for Yanya. She's really just Uh, I think redefined for all climbers, men and women on the circuit, this is what it means to be good. And that is you can do everything. And there isn't, I don't know, you might feel differently, but I don't feel like there's a style of route or move or boulder or anything that really doesn't suit her because she's just got so good at everything. And I think that's one of her big impacts on the sport is I think 
even talking to some of the climbers, they've um, privately, they've sort of gone, yeah, I need to up my game. She can do everything. I should be able to do everything. And I think that could be one of her biggest impacts is she's just shown you what, what, what it means to be the best. I think that's a good place to, to end the, the first part of our discussion. That's 40 minutes on, on Yanya Garnbrett. Let's, uh, let's move the focus because the entire discussion we've just had has actually really been about the effect of another climber on Yanya's season. So let's talk about our big winners. Uh, and I'm going to uh, hand it to Charlie as well to, to get the winners started. Yeah, I'm Ori. Um, already told my story about her in 2019, so I kind of got my got my timing right there. But um, yeah, no, no, it, it wasn't a fluke win, was it? It wasn't like there was some weird jump and Yanya fell off, and so did all the other series contenders. And I'm Ori, stuck it and carried on. She was the best climber on the day. Uh, the year it, that story I mentioned in 2019, had you, she was the best climber that day. No because root reading's a skill and she didn't have that. Physically, she was the best climber on the wall that day and she, she could have won in Hachioji in, uh, that year. So, um, Aimori is really going to be a force, but the Japanese team manage their athletes pretty carefully. They have pretty strict selection. Uh, I think they're one of the best teams at managing athlete workload and, and looking after their athletes. So, I, I don't think she'll be coming week in, week out. Um, but every time she comes, she's a, a serious contender. She w- she just will not let go, which in lead climbing, if you don't let go, you, you're probably going to do okay. And uh, she just refuses to let go. And uh, she's she's got the, the horsepower to do that. So we'll keep an eye on her, Mori. She, you This won't be the last win for her. I'm I'm interested because, you know, if if I just go on priors, I would have to say for Edinburgh, where I expect to see both Yanya and I again, I, I would still have to hedge my bets towards Yanya just because she has a much deeper proven record. And if if we just look at even just Coper, um, you, you could effectively call them tied coming out of qualifiers. It was close, but Yanya managed to top the semifinal route, whereas I didn't. And and again, you look deeply into the finals, and it was a, it was a hard fought climb for both climbers. Yanya wasn't very accurate going around a corner with a little too much dynamism, and and that's where she fell off. Whereas I had this exceptional high foot like just again we talk about the kind of contortion the compression contortion that let her make these stable moves where everybody else was having to do these reaches and and stretches and uh and uh, and jumps um so it's it's up in the air for me i completely agree that i has shown no signs that she's somebody that's going to fall off um but i i am hoping that it stays close um i'm not certain that she's going to take the gold next week uh or a couple weeks from now in jakarta if she chooses to attend um but i'm 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 more than ever excited to watch a comp this year because finally it does feel like there is a contender and that's the part that i hope that stays at this point i don't care whether it's yanya or or um i mori that win i just hope that we get to see you know i i some i've been trying to contemplate because i didn't watch world cups closely when you had the the duels between mina markovic and jane kim or when muriel sarkany and liv sansos would trade comps um in the early 2000s which i don't know if anybody can watch i don't know where the videos are of that if they exist right um and so living in this yanya period where there is kind of one default favorite to win a comp uh i've been so curious to see what it feels like to have uh kind of a uh two powers uh in in the competition scene and see if it feel like it takes away or adds to the level um my doubts have always been okay in the in the mina jane kim era were they both so exceptional and that's why they were kind of at each other's throats that you had two yanya level climbers or was it that the there were two people at a more at a more kind of like human level uh a more uh, attainable level it's so hard to tell when you've got two people duking it out back and forth and so i'm excited to experience Experience something like that watching the World Cups is hopefully having somebody that becomes a consistent challenger and it becomes a back and forth fight. I would love to see how Yanni behaves in that environment too because she hasn't really had to deal with that for the last couple of years since the people like Anik Verhoeven and uh, and uh, Jane Kim and all them have retired. Um, so I, I hope it means that we get to see a ton of Imori and, and that it stays close. <clears throat> I'd like to see if that's the case too. I, I'm just curious to see. 
Imori and her mentality if she would do a full season because we've seen with other competitors that if they do, especially young competitors, if they try to do a full season, um, they start off really strong in some cases, but then by the time that the end of the circuit's coming and they've been on the road for so long and they've dealt with so many time zone changes, their enthusiasm dips or whatever, and they're just they're just kind of over it, and and they they their results really plummet as a result. I, th- I think that's a skill too, not just being able to be at the top, but be at the top for an entire season these mm-hmm. long seasons boulder season or lead season that's something that not everybody could do especially when you're 16 17 18 years old and so i'd be really curious to see if if being on the circuit for a full season has any effect on imori's results as well we know we know she she can win when she just comes in for a, for like a one off but what if she's if she's really kind of doing the grind for months on end how would that be change things if at all i was going through her interviews mostly with japanese outlets it's kind of interesting because she talks about her climbing and her training very seriously and it's clearly something that matters a lot to her but at the same time over this last year it seems like getting into university has been the bigger priority and i'm 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 it's hard to tell from translations but i think my understanding was the priority this year was getting accepted and getting into post-secondary, which seemed to take most of her time, not so much being in school. So I'm curious if now that she's in school, if she's okay with splitting the load between university and the World Cup circuit, um, or if she if she's going to prioritize school entirely. Because what I got from the translations was this year was kind of a write-off because I need to get into school. I need to write these entrance exams. That is my priority for this year. So I, I hope now that she's in school that she's able to balance the two. That's the ideal. But again, it's kind of hard to tell from from what I'm reading. No comment. I don't know. I'm just like you. I'm curious. Yeah, no, no nobody needs to weigh in on that. Um, uh, that's uh, just- it's very admirable. If I'd listened a bit harder at school, I might have had a real job. So it's good to see. I'm, already, I'm already really prioritizing her education. Yeah, apparently. Yeah, if that's what Google trans, if Google Translate got it right, I don't know. There might be a Japanese word that's very close to school that means something else entirely. Who knows? She might have been. She's been concentrating on watching the debrief. She's yeah, like, probably. Go. That's 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 really what what uh, gets you uh, gets you ahead in the world is spending two hours every week watching this. Uh, <laughs> John, tell me about your winner from this event. My winner would be Brooke Rabatou. She is, she got the bronze medal here. Uh, yet another podium for her for this 2022 season. She's such an interesting case because she's one of those rare competitors where stardom really preceded her or or certainly preceded her in regards to like competition results. Like she had this great fame and it maybe wasn't in Congress with her her places that she was getting at competitions for a long time. Of course, all being because she she has famous uh, parents, Robin Herbisfield and DDA Rabatou. The results that she was achieving for a long time, as great as they were, and, and certainly great on the national level, on the international level, they didn't quite correspond to her level of fame. Even her year where she qualified for the Olympics and she became this global superstar, if you look at her World Cups, uh, at least in the lead division, she was still kind of in the in the 20s, which is respectable. You know, don't get me wrong, but it's like she got a 20th in Villar, 28th in Chamonix, 28th in Briançon. So that's kind of where she was last year, 2021. I think, Tyler, you and I on this show, we kind of thought of that as her breakout or banner year. She had a great year. She got a couple of bronze medals in bouldering. She got a silver medal in in lead. So it was a a fantastic year for her last year, career high year. And then now, this year, 2022, she has so significantly surpassed her best ever results. It's just like she's entered this whole new stratosphere And I think finally it feels like her fame is corresponding to her results or her fame level of fame is maybe justified a little bit. She she's got a couple of bronze this year in bouldering. She had a silver in in bouldering. She got a couple of bronzes in lead, I think now a silver in lead, if I remember correctly. So just yeah, it's been an awesome year for 
for Brooke. She continues to get great results. And when I was analyzing her performance here from Coper, the question occurred to me, how many Olympians, Olympian competitors, Tokyo Olympian competitors, can say that their best comp results have come after the Tokyo Olympics? I, it's not very many. Like, it's it's not very many competitors. And yet, Brooke Rabatou, she might be the, the, the biggest of all in terms of really post-Tokyo just having her best years and her best results ever. Yeah, I, I think Brooke's been exceptionally well managed by, I don't know if that's primarily from her folks. Uh, I suspect they have a big part to play in that, but also from USA Climbing. She, like you say, she... Well, I remember she used to climb in the World Cups and she'd be out like 20th out of the qualifiers and she'd come in the semis and I'd be thinking, oh, wow, it's one of the big stars is out. And I'd be, and then actually, when you, yeah, when you look at her results, it, she wasn't one of the big stars. She was just famous, which isn't really the same thing. Um, but I think she's been exceptionally well managed and I think there's been very little pressure on her. Um, there's external pressure because of her name and, and her, her lineage, but... There's not been, I don't think, any pressure from from her parents and from USA Climbing, and she's been allowed to just get better and get better and get better. She didn't explode onto the scene, as some people do. She came bit by bit. She was 30th, she was 20th, she was top 10, she was making finals, she was making podiums. And I think she's, I think she's been really well managed. I think her, whoever it is, whether it's her parents or USA Climbing, have just done a great job of letting her gain experience and letting the results come and not rushing her to try and achieve something early because she's still very young and uh, she's got plenty of time and I think they've done a great job of, of accruing results without uh, applying any pressure. And I just, as an aside one time, I remember, I don't know if it was Brooke's first time there or, or what it was, but for some reason we made a video about the, the family history at Arco because obviously Robin won there three times, should know that. Um, and, I, and I said to her, so did you ever say, hey, Brooke, me and your dad have won here, you know, no pressure, but you better, you better make, and Robin kind of knew I was joking, but he was pretty pissed off that I'd asked the question. Huh. She said, sort of no, I would never, ever do that. And I, it was obviously meant as a joke, mm -hmm. but it was, she was, yeah, she was kind of, I think I got the impression she was kind of annoyed I'd asked because it was so far from how she would talk to Brooke. And uh, it was quite an insight that, um, yeah, she was she was actually annoyed at the suggestion that she might put Brooke under pressure. Hmm. Um, maybe I was being a little sensitive, but that's how it came across. And and actually, I think that's probably explains a little bit about why Brooke's been, done so well because she's had that that good support network around her that just lets it happen naturally, and it's going to stop hmm. paying off. It is paying. If if Robin Urbisfeld responded to a joke of mine with a straight face, I would just crumble to dust. I would <laughs> I would not be able to handle that at all. Yeah. So it's I like, like, I know, she's pretty small and she's pretty slight, but when she stares you down, you yeah. No, I wouldn't be able to handle that at all. Good uh, good for you for even attempting to to ask a tongue in cheek question. <laughs> like flushing a little bit. Right. I was, only, I was only joking. I was only joking. Oh, sorry, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, I want to. I just want to follow up, kind of talking about her being one of the famous kids. And John and I have talked about this. They're uh, not just in the two thousand bracket, but you've got you know the Brooke Rabatou, uh, Tito Traversa, rest in peace, uh, Ashima Shiraishi, all those kids who came up and they were wonderkins because they were eight and nine and ten, and they were sending like twelves and thirteens or whatever. And it's incredible YouTube fodder, and it's great fodder for for John and and his crew, uh, journalists over at Climbing dot com, just getting those hits on the on you know the the young kids climbing hard stuff. Uh, and so, like, I, I, I think some some of it with her is it does come with a family name, but I'm glad you mentioned, uh, Charlie, the fact that there is so much knowledge in that family, be it coaching, the athlete experience, being a human being and a celebrity at the same time. She has so much, uh, you almost want to call it like institution, institutional knowledge in that family of how to deal with all these things. Um, but also in in that all that fame in the early 
part of uh, of her life. Uh, it was something not just from her accomplishments, but also just because uh, her parents and the family know how to uh, market the sends and and you know get this kid involved in the climbing industry if they want a future and and gently get into that with just like video appearances and uh, and things like that. And John, I think you succinctly put it a great way to to kind of wrap up. Uh, Brooke Rabatou is that it does feel like at this stage in her career, the attention she gets is for her own actual achievements at this point, right? For her competition achievements. And when we think about her as a name you have to mention in an analysis segment of a World Cup, you're talking about her because she is consistently in the finals. Uh, and she's an athlete that is always getting medals. She has the storyline of still trying to get that gold. It is about her now. It's no longer about her connections. It's no longer about her incredible achievements when she was only like, you know, four feet tall or whatever and 10 years old. She's she's matched almost the the all the fame and expectation that was put on her. And I think I think that's a great way to put it is that she's she's kind of filled out into the suit that that was kind of pre-built for her and it's very satisfying now because when she made the olympics it was very hard to talk about i i felt at that time that her achievements almost didn't live up to the expectation that you would want to put on an olympian uh and i had a lot of trouble talking about her because i felt like i was always being negative like i was making it sound like she shouldn't be there and all that kind of stuff um it is much easier to talk about her now and uh, it does feel more satisfying yeah, and, and I would just say as well, I think, uh, what just link it back to Yanya. Yanya exploded onto the scene, immediately starts doing every World Cup, wins most of them, and is amazing at 17. But that's actually still not how it happens for most people. For most people, it takes a long time to get good at this and to learn the game. And Brooke's been allowed to do that. And you mentioned it, Ashima earlier, and I don't want to throw anyone under the bus but I think if you look at how Ashima was managed versus how Brooke was managed and the trajectory of their careers, um, you could you could draw a few conclusions about how to manage an athlete is mm -hmm. all I would say. I would, if, like we've said it before, but when Katie Brown releases her book, if she's ever interested in hosting a podcast talking about being a celebrity climber in your, your early teens, I think that would be the most fascinating thing to listen to is hear the reflections of people that got the brightest spotlight on them so young and the different ways that can play out. And Brooke was, I don't want to say a lucky one, but it worked out for Brooke. Brooke is still involved in competitive climbing where for so many of them, you see that that love just disappear. Um, yeah. Anyway, um, my big winner is going to be uh, Luca Potichar. Um, I feel like we have to mention him. How amazing it must feel to win your first gold on home soil is just such an exceptional occasion. Not many people get to experience that, let alone ever winning a World Cup on their home soil. So so good for him. What a great place to start. Um, I guess in, in 2018, 2019, he started to be somebody that we would see in semifinals. And then particularly uh, in 2021, he broke into the scene coming, I think, second in Kron, again, on home soil. And then, of course, second at the World Championships. Uh, so all of a sudden, he was this up-and-comer that seemed destined for gold. And while he's been consistently in the upper semifinals and finals, it has finally happened. Uh, and so uh, congratulations to him and the Slovenian team. First Slovenian male lead win since Doman Skofic. Uh, so you got kind of a new guy in the family winning medals. And I guess my, my question that I wanted to just pose to you guys is, is what does it take for you to get extremely excited about a male climber knowing that so many male climbers end up winning gold medals and it's not uncommon for male competitors to win one gold medal in their career and maybe have it never come back again um compared to women's climbing where if you win gold one gold medal you are statistically expected at that point to win multiple golds very rare you get a single gold medal for a woman in their in their career so is this something where we should be looking forward to more and more medals from uh from luca do you get any good vibes off this kid or is he now just part of that pool of 30 male competitors that could win a gold on any given day uh i again i think he's the real deal i think he's i've watched him come up and unlike brooke uh the results have come slowly but they you look at the average position every season it's just getting better and better and, and again Again, like Brooke, he's well managed. I think Eddie talked about it on one of the debriefs about how the Slovenians are good at managing their athletes. Um, I think he's well managed. I think I think Matt Groom called him the Ice Man in commentary, <laughs> which is true. He's got the right temperament. I think you know you look at the top climbers; they're not 
that they're high after a win, but it's gone quickly, and they're low after a loss, and it's gone quickly. And I think he's probably um, got that character trait. So I, I think there's more to come from Luca. I think one of the frustrations with uh, men's climbing is that we don't see all the top climbers at all the events, which is slightly frustrating. It's always slightly hard to gauge mm-hmm. where where each climber stands. If we had Adam, Alex Megos, Jakob, we, we all know who the they, big names are. They really Adam seem like like they, they've got the case of senioritis. All of them just really buggered off for this last part of the season. It's kind of disappointing. Well, I think, sadly, I mean... I, I don't want to get into the debate about whether climbing should be in the Olympics, although I don't work for the IFSC anymore, so I am now free to have an opinion on that. Mm-hmm. But, uh, <laughs> but I think one thing you are going to see is that people will come and go and they will miss mm-hmm. years. I mean, Adam obviously became a dad this year. And um, yep. and it's his pattern too. Like Adam's never been that consistent. He's here one yeah. year, gone the next. But what you are going to see is a guy like Alex Megos, who maybe doesn't uh, love competitions as much as he loves outdoor climbing, He'll probably just bowl up the year before the Olympics, try and qualify, mm-hmm. do the Olympics and disappear for two years. And that's that's a slight frustration on the men's side. But it's it's probably an inevitable consequence of the Olympics because now there is this big thing every four years that would trump everything else. And you kind of think, well, why should I drag myself to Chongqing, sure. stay, in, stay in some crappy hotel and compete in a lead World Cup with 50 spectators? I'll just skip two years and, and try and do the Olympics. So it's going to happen more and more. Yeah. John, do you have anything on Luca? Well, to answer your question, Tyler, about what it takes to get truly excited about a a guy on the circuit, I think there's a few things. I think, first of all, to your point that both of you were saying, yeah, he has to stay on the circuit. Like, I I want a a competitor. If I'm going to invest in a competitor, then I want to feel like he is invested in the the circuit. And I want to feel like he's not just going to do a couple here and then flake out and do some outdoor stuff and then come back. With, you know, I know reasons i know why the competitors do that and i'm not saying that's you know that's necessarily bad but in terms of me to get invested in a new name i want to see him be a consistent presence on the circuit um i also want him to string together some consistent some some more wins and this was a great start for for luca he's it was really fun it was a fun one to watch so let's see if he can do it again um and if so i think you're going to see more and more people get on board and thirdly yeah i want him to have a little bit of charisma i don't feel like we've seen enough of Luca in terms of interviews and profile pieces and stuff to kind of know where he stands. The Iceman thing can kind of go either way. It can be great in a competitive sense, but sometimes if you have that in terms of your public persona as well, it, it can't make, it doesn't make for the most captivating, uh, you know, person captivating interview, that type of thing. So we'll see. I don't know. I've never met him. So I, it's hard for me to speak about his, charisma and stuff but um but i absolutely stick him on the winners list here because this was a great comp for him and uh and i'm excited to see what he does going forward this is a debate for another day but um let's keep in touch because i think that it's there's a hole uh, in climbing where we don't know the climbers as people and um work is being done to try and change that stay tuned great um we're on it we're on a hard out so i don't want to i don't want to dig too deep into the losers uh into the uh the losers topic so i'm going to start because mine is extremely surface uh my my losers topic is they got rid of the the ifsc music that we got to know over the last couple seasons it hasn't i don't think it's appeared at all this season maybe it did early in bouldering um i'm not going to sing it but if you've been watching for a couple of years, it's in your head. It starts with the shitty guitar riff and then there's some horns and stuff and maybe some hand clapping. It's like very generic stock music. But I had gotten to the point where at the end of a broadcast, I would stick around for that final second because it was this final satisfying moment of it's that song. They've got the highlight reel that plays over it. And here the, the deal with music is... Once you become familiar with it, it's you start to attach meaning to it. And after a few seasons, that was my music for IFSC comps. It was the start of every competition and the end of every competition. And it has since been replaced by a revolving door of random ambient percussion tracks with zero melody. And as much as I don't care for the, the song that the IFSC was using that I am talking about... 
once a melody gets in your head, it just becomes something that you care about. It's something that you're nostalgic for. And even if it's not that great from a production standpoint, you start to be attached to it. And I'm really frustrated that, frustrated that it is gone, let alone being replaced by music with no character, no memorable melody at all. Um, I'm kind of disappointed. Um, so I, I saw there was a job posting for uh, somebody involved in media. I don't know if that's the person that decides what music gets gets placed on the broadcast, but that is my request for whoever's in charge of, of the broadcast stuff is bring that song back or give me something with some melody so I can get hooked to it. Um, I don't know if anybody cares to comment on that. Otherwise, let's just keep it moving and get you guys out for uh, for your commitments. Well, the one thing I would say is I hated the music. <laughs> Because it always made me nervous, and I can't sure. hear it now without also hearing the director in my ear counting me down, which always gotcha. made me nervous. So, so I actually can now watch the comps and not get stressed just before them, because I always associate that music with like thirty seconds, twenty. <laughs> sure. So, it's kind of nice for me. It's, on, it's... On, in my world, you're just gonna have to take one for the team. Unfortunately, it's uh, <laughs> it's a secondary concern. If um, I have back to the ifsc and they don't play that music i'm going to miss my cue though that's for sure i just there knew. you go <laughs> yeah uh yeah. because because it's in the same vein uh, uh charlie do you want to hit us with your uh, with your loser uh yeah production standards um again this was a, a factor in me leaving the ifsc i i just feel like um they could prioritize the production so much more i feel like this i mean i i gave them a lot of feedback about easy wins you could make um to improve your production that wouldn't cost you anything, wouldn't it wouldn't cost you any time, wouldn't cost you any money. And there's still glaring issues with the production which could be so easily solved and it's really frustrating to watch. Um, they did take one bit of feedback on board. They obviously, well, it wasn't from me. They got a new commentator, so. Uh, <laughs> they were getting feedback from someone else, but my feedback got ignored. Uh, and their prerogative but it's still frustrating to watch the broadcast when there are so many things that you could just tweak and it would make it look so much better well let me quickly ask then you're saying that money isn't the problem for a lot of the issues then uh money's usually like I... used as an excuse you know oh we haven't got the budget you think well how much is a curtain to put across the stage door you know why do we need to see a guy with a clipboard standing in the door just before Yanya appears it was stuff like that that i was messaging them about Ask the judge, you know, get the judges to kneel down so we can't see the back of their head in a Boulder World Cup. Get a, when the curtain opens, have the guy that's holding the clipboard on the other side of the curtain so that we don't see him when Yanni walks out. It's, it's simple stuff like that. And so it probably doesn't bother anyone else, but when you're watching it week in, week out, you just think, oh, this would look so much more professional if I couldn't see the judges' heads, if I couldn't see the guy with the clipboard, if we always took the wide shot instead of the close-up at the crucial moment. Um, and like I say, minor details. We, we know climbing's in a good place when these are the quibbles we're talking about, but they still bug me because they were my reality when I worked there and there's still a reality. They bug me. John, what about you? What's your, uh, what's your loser from all this? Yeah, my loser would be the American men's squad. And I say that with all due respect to the three American men who participated and climbed hard and placed. Nathaniel Coleman was the highest of them. He placed 27th. Jesse Gruper was 32nd and Ben Hanna was 49th. But that was it. There was, there were only those three in terms of American guys. And, and looking at those results too, that's a steep decline to not have a single American man ad in the semis, let alone in the finals. It kind of, when the finals popped up on screen, the list of the men's finalists, actually one of my first thoughts was, oh, this looks like a final from like 2013, 2014, <laughs> back in the days when it was kind of the norm not to see any man, American man in the in the finals. We've, we've been kind of spoiled lately to pretty consistently see at least one American man in the finals, if not two men or even more than that two, more than two American men in there but beyond all of that to not even field a full squad American men's squad to only have three three guys I I don't know I've, I've heard that some of them that have been on the circuit I have some intel that some of them were just kind of feeling a little burned out 
I don't know. I, I can't say that that's the case for all of the American men that had been on the circuit for this whole season. I don't know. Uh, I know Colin Duffy started semester at, at college and stuff. But regardless, just looking at that, only three American men, that's a bad that's a bad look. I think it's frustrating for fans. I think it's a, it's kind of a bit baffling to me as a reporter because I look at that and I think, well, why should American fans and American viewers turn out if clearly so many American climbers themselves didn't turn out for this event um, in, in on the American men's side? And so I think, in a sense, it kind of stalled some of the great momentum that the American men had built up up until this event with some some podiums and some medals and all that i don't want to make too big a deal about it because i think maybe we'll see what happens in edinburgh maybe we'll see more american men back on the squad uh maybe a fuller american men's team but i was just it's like oh gosh only three american men after after such a great season up to this point surprised yeah, yeah. second I, I I think you I think you make a good point. You win the loser section for me. That was by far the best comment. Sorry, Tyler. But I'm I'm just going to put something out there. Trump goes out in 2020. American climbing goes crap. Are the two related? I'm just putting it out there. I just had to had to make it political. Amazing, fantastic, fabulous president of all time, who goes and then USA climbing falls out. Coincidence? Feel free if somebody wants to submit an essay. Feel free uh, for for their political science class or whatever. <laughs> I'm 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 just, I'm just saying, you know, you had the, you had the greatest human who's ever lived. So. I'm I'm in deep no comment territory. Climbing. <laughs> this is the thing about climbing is you think you think politically it's all one way, but you've got an extremely liberal outdoorsy free-spirited urban sect and then on the other side you've got the rugged individualist climbing is is you know this this uh, uh this sport where i want to be away from everything away from everybody away from government control it's a pretty like politically fractured uh, uh um uh demographic frankly not that that's why i i care i just have nothing to add to this point but uh but yeah gotta be careful because i'm gonna get half of the climbing fans furious um so I I don't. I don't know how fractured it is. I, I think if only people who are into climbing could vote, I'm not sure Trump would have ever been president. But maybe, who knows, maybe. man? Who knows? I don't. I don't go by votes. I go by the loudest people in the YouTube comments. That's the only way to judge a, a you know, a, a political uh, uh, leaning of people, right? Um, I don't know. See if you can guess. I live in the in the biggest city in Canada. Former gardener, jazz music player, and I work in a climbing gym. Take a guess which way I lean. Um, but anyway, we're gonna cut it there because we got a hard out. So I want to say first, thank you. I, John's got his pencil up. Yeah, You're the one I with do. the hard I, out, so it's your. No, no. I know. Real briefly, I want to give an honorable mention to Natalia Grossman. Because if anybody saw her Instagram, apparently she was dealing with some food poisoning, but not just food poisoning. Like, I mean, really bad. Sound quite frankly, she was in like an life, ambulance. Is that what I saw? Threatening. Yeah, like she. Damn. Um, it said the symptoms progressed to the point where she couldn't even breathe, and she had to spend the night. She was confined to her her bed for a couple days. It just sounded like a really scary situation, obviously a situation that's way more important than any climbing and stuff. She, she still managed to advance to the finals, which is incredible. But uh, obviously there were larger, more important things at play here. So um, I don't know if she listens to this show or not, but just um, a heartfelt just um, joy from all of us that she's feeling better and, and recovered because that sounded really terrible and really scary so i'm i'm glad that she's uh doing well yeah way to tough it out and and on cue the internet started cracking out on you john halfway through that as uh, the internet knows we have to end the uh, end the episode all the audio came through just you went fully fully face glitch so you're being played off by uh by my internet <laughs> connection so we're gonna wrap it so as always thanks to john bergman uh for joining us for every single competition our special guest this week was uh charlie bosco follow him on instagram see what he's doing uh always fun stuff and of course for us uh make sure you like the video subscribe to this channel Join our Discord channel if you like talking about competitions, especially as they are live happening in the moment. We've got people from all around the world having a great time talking about what's going on. And then lastly, if you want to support the channel, you can also check out the Patreon link below. Otherwise, thank you to these two guys and thank you for watching. We'll see you in the next one.